Welcome everybody to another session of Workplace Therapy. My name's Scott Arrieta. I'm the founder and CEO of Unity and Company. We're a consulting firm that leverages a strategic understanding of human experiences to help organizations unlock best-in-class business performance. Now, last week, my co-host Skylar Lewandowski and I started a conversation on change management and what a lot of companies get wrong about leading through change and what they could be doing better. Um, It was a great conversation, but we realized that we had a ton of stuff to get on the table. And so we divided the episode into two sessions. And today we're going to pick up with the second and final part of that conversation. We're going to be discussing specific tips of how organizations can prepare at the company level, the managerial level, and the individual level to lead through change more effectively. So we hope you enjoy it. We're going to pick up now. So what do you think from a company perspective would be like, I don't know, your one to three things that they really need to do in order to prepare their managers and the rest of the employees for a change? Yeah, well, all plus one very heavily on the whole like celebrating bright spots or, you know, celebrating short term wins. I think that's that's definitely a strong one. Um, I think another one is this idea of I'm probably stealing this term from somewhere, but creating an army of emissaries, right? Like, so this is like creating your coalition for lack of a better term. Um, And this is really, it really goes back to the change curve, right? And the fact that it's like, okay, you have an idea of what a change is because you're one of the few people who have been in the inner circle, you've kind of been plotting behind closed doors. But at a certain point, you need to start engaging your emissaries. And those emissaries need to be, It's most effective if they're like non-leaders, right? It's not that you can, it's not that you should leave leaders out. Like invite more junior level leaders like to your change management council or your change management teams. Um, But it's really important that you have people on the ground or people who are going to be on the front lines of the change. So in the example of our multi-channel engagement, um, It's really important that you have individual contributors, the people who were considering becoming multi-channel agents and the people who ultimately decided to become multi-channel agents. And you engage them in the decision making, not all of it, right? They don't have to make the high level strategic decisions like the high level strategic decision had already been made, right? We are going to expand to multi-channels. And we cannot pay you anymore. Those are the structural things that have already been decided. There is no way out, right? But there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of interpretation, room for interpretation that we can have within those structural constraints. You know what I'm saying? And the more that you can hand those over to the people who are actually going to be responsible for making the change, or at least give them input into what that should look like, the, the more effective your change is going to be because what's going to happen when you actually launch the change and 90% of the organization is like, I wasn't in that room with you. So I'm at the very beginning of the change curve. I'm still in denial. Instead of having a bunch of suits up there, you know, with a mic in all hands saying like, Hey, I'm five levels away from the pain that you're going to feel by doing this. But it's the best thing for us. So thanks for doing it. Like instead, like that just doesn't resonate. But if you have somebody on the ground saying like, Hey guys, look, I know that this is tough. Like I had those same fears myself. And the way that I kind of came to grips with them was I started thinking about it this way and we gave this feedback and we batted it around and that resonates so much more. And not only that, what I found is your emissaries very often become your bench for future leaders. Right. Because like what a better training ground than to lead side to side. That's so much harder than leading with positional authority where I'm your boss. You have to do what I say. A lot of people default to that dynamic, but shoulder to shoulder leaders, they have to lead through influence and through the meritocracy of their ideas. Right. And cultivating that while there's still ICs, you're going to have an unstoppable bench within couple quarters a year of doing this intentionally. So, so many reasons why creating an army of emissaries is a great idea from a company perspective. I'd say it's like the number one thing about change management that most companies 
don't consider, but to their detriment. Um, the next thing is creating forums to read out on progress um, and taking questions if possible. So we talked about this with the multi-channel example, creating office hours, creating all hands, having Q and A's, basically creating as much room for conversation as possible because people really respond positively to having their input be considered. And Skylar, one of your favorite things, disagree and commit, right? It's <laughs> yeah. like in order to disagree, well, not that disagreement is one of your favorite things, but like you want the opportunity <laughs> to be able to voice a disagreement, right? And sometimes you'll win and that disagreement will create an alternate approach. And sometimes you'll lose, but you'll at least have line of sight into why your alternate perspective was not ultimately chosen. And you can at least wrap your head around that conceptually, even if you don't like fully believe it in your heart, right? And like that makes it easier than letting your dissatisfaction fester because you never said what you were thinking to begin with. I do love disagreeing, but <laughs> <laughs> do you think- I do on, love playing devil's advocate. I yeah, do. Um, do you think on those- like forums to take questions, is it important to have an anonymous forum or is it okay to like have names attached to it? Do you have feelings about this? Oh my gosh. You are hitting on something that's like very, um, it's very near and dear to my heart because as a new leader, like when I was in this role, um, I wasn't a new leader, but I was new to this level of leadership where I had this much scope of um, of authority, right, of this entire operation center. And um, I hated anonymous feedback as a leader. Like if I was if I was going to be really honest about it, and the reason that I hated it was because of the fact that like some people would use the anonymity as an opportunity just to be not very helpful or sometimes really downright nasty, right? Like, and again, like a lot of the people that I was leading here were early career. And so they hadn't yet like developed more effective ways of communicating. And so they had used the anonymous feedback channels to say things that were like, just really like, personally hurtful. Like they'd like talk about, like they talk about somebody that they didn't like in terms that just attacked their like personality, like versus, um, or their physical appearance versus something more fundamental about who they are. Um, or they'd use it in a way to make really snide remarks about something that they didn't agree with instead of being more, I don't want to say solutions oriented because I don't think it's important to always have a solution. But I do think that there are ways of having significant disagreements with issues where you're making, you're at least doing your part to make the issue very clear and the problem that needs to be solved very clear. Um, and you're in, you're conferring like positive intent or at least a willingness to listen on the people that you're submitting the feedback to versus like if you start your feedback statement with, an all out attack. Like, why are we effing do this? It's effing stupid. Don't you effing care? This is just another example of X, Y, and Z. Like sometimes you'd get feedback like that. Right. Um, and so as a young leader, uh, you know, I was like, man, why can't, why can't people be more emotionally regulated? Why can't they be more mature? Why can't they be more professional? Why, like, you know, these, these youngins, you know, like what are, what are they doing? Like, you know, we're, we're here and out of the goodness of where our hearts, we're extending this anonymous feedback tool. And here they are just like taking that, which was offered with purity of intent and like slapping us in the face with it. Like, that's what I legitimately thought early on. And then I realized because I had a lot of mentors um, kind of helping me through this part of my development that it was me who was emotionally dysregulated. It was me who was personalizing that feedback. It was me who was taking it too personally. And it was me who was failing to read between the lines, right? It's like the snideness, the snarkiness, the personal attacks, they're not good, right? And if somebody had done it 
without anonymity, like if I had witnessed it out on the floor, I would definitely address it. And I would say that that's not appropriate behavior. That's not in keeping with our culture. That's not in keeping with our values. Let's have a conversation about this. Right. So I'm not saying that the behavior was okay, but I am saying that me as a leader, I would rather have unfiltered, slightly unprofessional perspectives, but have line of sight to them than not have line of sight to them at all. You know what I'm saying? And I think if anonymity is something that makes people feel empowered and psychologically safe to submit their feedback where they otherwise wouldn't, that is an asset to me as a leader. I don't have to implement everybody's feedback. You know, I don't have to agree with the personal attacks. I don't have to internalize the negative things that are said about me as a leader. Right. But it is my job to read between the lines. It is my job to see the anger and have compassion on the anger and not react to the anger. Right. To see a personal attack that is like levied against me and try to say like, what is, what's at the heart of this? You know, and is it something that I can address? You know, and it's really frustrating, Skylar, because you know that like I like to help people. I love to talk <laughs> to to people about their issues and like work through it with them. And I mentioned in a previous podcast, I didn't want to not be liked. And so all of those things made it really, really hard for me to see anonymous feedback that was offered in a spirit of maliciousness or a spirit of anger. But upon reflection, what I realize is that like, yes, you should absolutely have anonymous feedback and it, in, in order to leverage that properly, you have to train your leaders on emotional regulation, on service and on compassion, right? On not taking things personally, on leaders being solutions oriented versus getting embroiled in all of the the muck and the, and the bullshit, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I think, that's, uh, that's my journey. <laughs> no, it's, thank you for sharing that because I think the leaders who see anonymized feedback and it is malicious because, you know, I think all humans are very emotional and we get angry. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that anger can be used as a good force or a bad force. And sometimes with anonymous feedback, you get the bad side of it, but the leaders who, see that and say, oh, well, we're just going to change now to not anonymize feedback. So I don't get that. You're totally right. It's like, it's not about the people who were saying the comments. It's like that leader needs to grow as an individual and as a company. Mm. And I think the, mm. the companies that are like, oh, we don't need anonymized feedback because like we don't get very helpful solutions oriented feedback in the, in the anonymized like feedback forum. It's like, that's not the point of feedback. Like the point of feedback is to have like to air emotions out, not to have a hundred percent solutions oriented responses. I, um, I think about this all the time. There was, um, I think the only reason Skylar that I was able to, eventually adapt my thinking was because I had an HRBP who was frankly phenomenal, right? And she, she sat in all my meetings. Like I basically engaged her like I would a member of my core leadership team. And on more than one occasion, like she would challenge me and she'd be like, look, that sounds like your shit. <laughs> right. It's like, you're not, you're not seeing what's underneath this. I get that it wasn't like, you know, drafted in the most constructive way, but you're also not listening, <laughs> you know? And my God, Skylar, like everybody needs somebody like that in their lives. Somebody who is brave enough to just call you out on your bullshit <laughs> and say like, this is where you need to grow, you know, and like help you to think through things like that. And honestly, without her, I probably would have been too overwhelmed by what everybody else thought of me to be effective in that role. Yeah. And I think the, the comments are going to be made no matter what, 
Like they're going to yeah, either be in your true. Slack channels or they're going to be that's in your uh, feedback pile. So yeah, the, the leaders have a choice. Like they can either see them or they can just like brush them and pretend like they're not there. But I promise you that they are in the Slack channels. So <laughs> is there true. a way, because we talked a lot of now about managers equipping, like equipping managers for this change. Is there something that companies can do better from that perspective so that managers don't take, you know, attacks and emotions responding during change personally? Like what can we do for managers? Yeah, there's a lot that we can do and we need to do for managers. And I think this is another area of just consistent underinvestment, right? And it's because you don't really like think about it, right? But again, we said at the top of this podcast that change is the only constant. Right. And I think the reason a lot of companies don't think about training their managers to lead through change specifically is because of the fact that they don't have a change that's top of mind right now. But guess what? Next quarter you will. And then you're going to be asking your managers to lead the charge. And like the middle management layer, I think, is often overlooked because I think the executives think about the strategic reasons for the level of the change and they invite like VPs or, you know, maybe directors to have that conversation with them. Right. And then they develop a message to roll out the change that is primarily geared towards individual contributors or like first and second line people. And the people who are not really engaged with a lot of intentionality, maybe they're read in a day before, right, are the first level line leaders, second level line leaders, like the people in the middle. But those are the people who are actually going to be dealing with the things that break with all of the actual feedback. They're the ones who have the, the trust and line of sight to the front lines and the things that they're dealing with, right? And, um, and they're the ones that get underinvested. So number one is like invest ahead of time into training your managers on change leadership competencies, right? And shameless plug, Unity and Company, we've developed a pretty comprehensive leadership program called the Catalyst Leadership Engagement, in which change management is one of the main modules. And we do teach leaders how to lead through change effectively, um, regardless of where they sit in the organization. Um, But one of the things that we teach is this idea, and I mentioned it earlier in the podcast, Skylar, but it's connecting purpose to action, right? It's, you know, again, it's, you know, it's kind of like engaging both the elephant and the rider, right? But it takes skill. It's basically saying like, here's the change, okay? Here's why the change matters, right? Here's how it ladders up to our mission, our vision, and our values. Here's what we need of you for the change, right? So the actions that we are asking of you, it's not just in service to implementing this HRIS. It's because this HRIS enables our mission, vision, and values, right? And the actions that we need to take are ultimately in service of that broader objective. So for example, the multi-channel example that we talked about previously That was the vision. Like we are here to serve our clients. We're here to serve them more effectively, continuing to do things by email only. It's not an option because we have such an opportunity to invest in the way that people feel about themselves when we really nail their fashion and styling choices in a way that truly resonates with them. When we get them the right fit, it has a transformative impact on not only their day, but everybody's days that they come in contact with. You know, and painting that picture, that was a huge part of what got people to raise their hands because they wanted to be a part of that, right? They, everybody wants purpose and meaning in the thing that they do every day. Um, so, so yeah, connecting purpose to action. Um, and then I think getting good at telling the story. So like, this is another area where emotions play a part. So, um, Skylar, was it you that went with me to the Duarte presentation seminar? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I feel like it was us, right? Oh yeah. man, we've done so many great things together. So like there's um, there's this firm for our listeners out there called Duarte um, and they are just masters at developing really compelling decks. Like they helped Al Gore with his Inconvenient Truth um, TED Talk deck. 
Inconvenient Truth, right? Yeah, the one about climate change. Okay. Um, and they develop this beautiful deck, but not only do they develop beautiful slides, it's the way that those slides are constructed and the way that the story is told, right? And one of the things that Duarte talks a lot about is creating emotional tension. And that why that's effective it's because we're emotional creatures and we have an elephant to engage, like as we've talked about through this series, right? But, you know, but basically like if you look at like Martin Luther King's, you know, I have a dream speech. If you map out his speech, he's like, I have a dream and he has this idealized future state. But then he talks about what the current state is and it's shitty. <laughs> and then he talks about like what a great future state was. And then he's constantly playing on this emotional tension. Right. And I think one of the things that leaders need to get better at is understanding and leaning into that emotional tension in the way that you tell stories and the way that you lead through change. So there's something that McKinsey developed called the SCR framework, Situation Complication Resolution. And essentially what it does is it's a, it's a three act format, right? So if you watch a movie, you have the first act, which is really just kind of like setting the stage. Like here's, here's our hero. Here's the context in which they live. Here's what's normal. And then in the second act, some shit goes down, <laughs> you know, like there's some complicating factor that makes everything just more, you know, more complicated, more tense. There's like an existential threat that's introduced. We're worried now. Right. So we go from feeling like really comfortable in our current state to really worried. And then act three is typically like where the hero, the protagonist kind of like resolves everything and everything comes together in the end. Right. And the reason that that works, it's like, you know, nutrition for our soul is because of the emotional journey that it takes us on all the way to resolution where a nice bow is wrapped on it and we're done. Right. And our slides and the way that we tell stories if you can adhere to the SCR framework, you'll find that you're much more effective at getting through to the individual because you're taking them along for the ride. You're giving them all the necessary context because in act one, the situation, you're telling them everything they need to know about what current state is. And in act two, the complication, you're telling them everything they need to know about why the current state isn't good enough. <laughs> and in act three, the resolution, you're like, but here's how we're going to be the heroes and we're going to save the day. Right. And so I think that's a huge part of change management is telling the story in that framework and then letting people know where on this journey are we right now? We're in act one. We're going to be in act two. We're moving to act three. Right. And then once we're in act three, celebrate because it's, you know, the happy ending that we were all hoping for. I think most change management slide decks that I've seen completely skip over that second piece. They're like, nothing is going to go wrong. You know, this <laughs> like, let's, o let's only focus on the positive. You know, this is only going to increase efficiencies, but it's like, they don't actually say what would happen if we stayed in our current condition. So I think that's really important to, to basically bring people along on the journey of like, how did you make this strategic decision? Because it, it wasn't just about getting better. It was about like, we can't stay where we are. I love that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's like, because if you, and, and if, gosh, if you don't invest in telling that part of the story, then you'll have a lot of people attacking the premise, right? And you'll never move away from act one because people, like the tendency is to stay put, right? Like, you know, so if you're comfortable in act one and act one seems great, <laughs> then stay in act one. Why introduce act two? Act three seems superfluous and you're just doing this to me, right? Like why do all the shit that we need to do to get to act three if I don't even know that there's an act two? But like to you, like to your point, Skylar, yeah, it's like the critical piece of act two is saying why we can't stay in act one, you know? And so we have to get to act three because act two is no fun, you know? So Skylar, I've been talking for a while and, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about how important it is to engage individuals for their perspectives, like as it pertains to change management. Um, so what do you think are like other important considerations when you're planning for change and considering the individuals, not just the managers or the company objectives? I think from the individual perspective, it's good to approach change like 
you normally would in your daily life. I think there's this change equation that you've probably heard of. It's from Buddhist philosophy and it's suffering equals pain times resistance, meaning that the pain that we feel during change is really only caused by how much we resist it. And of course, there are going to be times where, you know, certain situations are just extremely painful (laughs) and like we, we should resist them a little bit. But I think in terms of like work change and strategic changes or, you know, team changes on how we like take phone calls or, you know, any of our examples before the people who are feeling that pain are just resisting the change. And this happens a lot at growing startups where employees get there really early on and they get stuck in this like good old day mindset and they're resisting growing with a company, which is almost funny because they are there because they want the company to grow. And then they resist when the company does grow and things do have to change. So I think the number one thing would be to not resist the changes at work that you feel are aligned with your like work boundaries and values, which is the second piece is that you should really make clear what your work boundaries are, what your work values are, because accepting all change isn't realistic. If we bring back, you know, Elon Musk at Twitter, if the company decides to change drastically how you work or the company values, you either have to say this isn't aligned with me and I should leave, which is also hard (laughs) or accept the changes without thinking about those previous good old days, which I think is also hard. And I guess like just know that change is going to be hard no matter what, which means that you have to express those feelings to somebody that you feel that like you can trust. And so hopefully that is your manager. Hopefully that is the anonymous feedback forums, but express those feelings because no matter what change is hard. Um, and then once you express those feelings, kind of let it go and don't get stuck on those feelings. Disagree and commit. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's so great. It's like important not to get nostalgic, um, about the good old days. Right. And to just kind of accept that change is It's a natural part of growth. Like you're either growing or you're dying you know, is, is a quote that I've heard that like really resonates with me. There's not a lot that's really just in a state of stasis, you know? Um, so yeah, so to some extent, like change, I do think is like, is a constant and like, we have to open ourselves up to change. And I love this idea about suffering being pain times resistance, right? Because you might not be able to influence the pain right away. But since it's a multiplicative formula, if you take resistance down to zero, pain times zero equals zero, right? So suffering equals zero. Like if you can resist down to zero, you know? And, um, and I think like, that's, that's like a hard pill for people to swallow. Right. I think like, especially (laughs) Americans, because I think like resistance and rebellion is kind of like ingrained into our ethos, like as a people, right? And I do think it's important though, because, you know, Skylar, you and I were talking about this before the show. It's like a lack of resistance doesn't mean a lack of self-awareness as to what is important to you, right? So like there are some people, I do want to say this, like we talk a lot about work on this show, um, obviously. Work is not our identity. It happens to be a place where we spend a ton of our time. Right. And I think that for most people or for most people that listen to this podcast, they're like early mid career. Right. And so they're really kind of like thinking about how to keep growing, how to attain, you know, that level of influence at their at their job. And so we kind of assume that you're looking to make an impact and grow within the context of what you've chosen to do for your profession. Um, But that being said, for some people, I just want to say this out loud like, like stability is kind of like a preferred value of theirs, right? Like not changing things too much because they have other things in their life that take up their mental, emotional, physical bandwidth. You know, it's really important. Like if you're caring for a family member, right? Or if you, um, if you have, 
other just like really stressful like relationships in your life that you need to prioritize for the time being, right? If you're working on yourself and your mental health and you just need like a stable work environment so that you can sustain your lifestyle, right? Then, you know, then maybe for that period of time in your life, stability and looking for minimal change and minimal growth in a professional context actually makes the most sense for your development, right? So if that's you, we're not looking to, you know, shame you into trying to lean more heavily into your career, right? Um, That is your individual value. And if you are faced with an organization that is leading a disruptive change and one of your values is stability because it's a necessity, then I think like that's, that's an area where in order to not resist it, um, you need to just accept, okay, this change is happening. It's going to impact my day to day in a way that's not sustainable for me. And so it's time to say goodbye and like find another place that does meet my value of stability. Would you agree with that, Skylar? Yeah, I was actually just thinking that I've had this discussion with so many of my friends where I'm like, would you work at a startup? And they're like, no, because it is too unstable, not in a sense of, uh, am I going to have a job or not? It's just that there's constantly change going on in the organization. And you're right. Like at certain points in your life, you have to say, these are my boundaries right now. These are my values. And I need to honor myself with that. And I need to go to a company that has less change because every organization, no matter what, even if it's the oldest organization in the world, like they're going to have some change. It's just, does change occur on a quarterly or a yearly basis? Or does the change occur at a startup on like a, you know, hourly basis? (laughs) And so it's, (laughs) but I, but I do think like if you are in a startup, accepting and not trying to resist change will help you deal with those changes because if you're at a startup, it's going to be changing nonstop. That's part of what you signed up for. Well, and like tying it to your why too, right? Cause like one of the things that I talk with Monica about, so Monica was on the podcast a couple of episodes ago and, um, we've had similar career paths in terms of industries, right? We started in financial services, or actually we started in retail. We both worked for Starbucks. Then we went to financial services. Then we both went to tech, but, um, our paths have been kind of divergent in that she's consistently chosen to work with larger brands, right? Huge companies, right? And after business school, I went the startup route, right? And so we talk about this all the time because we kind of like, get what's it called jealous I guess of each other's situations right because like she's in the situation where she's worked with companies that everybody has heard of where you just say the name of the company and people are like oh wow you work for that company that's fantastic and I've worked for companies where people are like I've never heard of that company before right and so it's like okay well there's that but also like our lifestyles are quite different right it's like her days are a lot more predictable things change at a very slow pace right she it's theoretically easier. I won't say it's universally easier, but like most times it's easier for her to at least understand how her week is going to materialize. And like, you know, the variation of like emotional and actual workload um, that she gets faced with is much narrower than what it was for me, where it was like a much wider range, right? Where like new, there are new changes launching all the time. Um, But there's a flip side of that, which is at the end of like my 10 year period working with startups and her 10 year period working with like large tech companies, in terms of the things that I got to do, right? Um, And got to see, I got like, 30 years worth of experience out of 10 years worth of actual time invested. Right. And, you know, she got to do some impressive stuff too, but it wasn't accelerated at the pace of, of mine. Right. And I would say to people like very early in your career, like one of the ways that you can ground yourself and connect yourself to the reason for the change and convince yourself that it's worth it is by taking that approach and thinking about like, man, this is going to be a story that I'm going to be telling at every interview for the rest of my career. I've had projects like that. I've had changes that I've navigated and been a part of where 
it happened 15 years ago, but I still talk about it to this day because it was that impressive, like what was accomplished when we did that thing together. So that's another way of like helping to reduce the resistance or the emotional burden of like, of delving into the changes, really internalizing what is in it for you and viewing that comprehensively and holistically. And I think if you're at a startup, knowing that even with this change, it's going to change again. <laughs> so, you know, there's, you're never yeah. in a bad position for too long, I would say at a startup. I think maybe at larger companies, if there's a big strategic shift, then you're like, oh, this is going to you know, impact me for a while, but at a startup, you know, it could only last a month. So <laughs> just know that the next yeah. change is always going to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. I mean, you know, there's obviously, uh, there's obviously a shadow side to that, but like, um, but yes, that resonates with me very, very deeply. Well, Skylar, thank you so much for taking the time um, to uh, to talk about change and navigating change management with me. Um, for you listeners out there, um, if this has really kind of struck a chord and you're navigating huge change in your organization and you're looking for um you're looking to make an investment in developing your leaders and equipping them to lead through that change. I mentioned it earlier in the podcast, but we at Unity and Company have just launched our Catalyst Leadership Engagement. It is a very comprehensive three-day training program that equips leaders with the skills, behaviors, and competencies that they need to build high-performing teams. And change management and communication is a big part of what we teach in this course. So if that's something you're interested in learning more about, you can email us at info at unityandcompany.com or info at workplacetherapy.net. Until next time. This is Scott and Skylar signing out for Workplace Therapy.